Today is January 11th, 2023, and I am Sandra Lackey Carlson. I'm here at the Tualatin Heritage Center with Mike Lofton, and we are recording an interview with Norm Parker, who uh, was a longtime resident of uh, Tualatin, Oregon, and still lives nearby. And he's going to give us his, his story, his life story. So welcome, Norm, and thank you for coming. Thank you, Sandra. And would you start by um, maybe telling where you were born and uh, grew up? Yes, I was uh, born in Burns Lake, uh, British Columbia, which is about the center of the province. And that came about because my dad was one of the original homesteaders up there in 1912. And uh, he'd lived there alone until 1927, and he came back to Grants Pass, where he was originally from, and uh, got acquainted by mother through his sisters, who uh, were celebrating a 50th wedding anniversary of their grandparents, of their parents, of my grandparents. Anyway, they got acquainted and he went back to the ranch in Canada and take care of the animals and so forth and started corresponding with my mo mother, soon to be mother, Marguerite Scott, and uh, talked her into moving up there. And that was before the day of television, television obviously, but also even radios. They didn't have radios in that area. My dad had the first radio, but that wasn't until about 1923. And all the, the mostly bachelor uh, pioneers would come over to his place and listen to, listen to uh, Lum and Abner and, and uh, Lone Ranger and all those, uh, all those programs that were on at that time. But anyway, so my, that's so, my mother moved up there and I had a sister, my older sister was born in 1930 and I followed in 1934. So that's how come I became a Canadian and was born there. And- uh, what, what was your sister's name? Helen. And your father's? Well, my mother's name was Marguerite. My sister's name was Helen. Mm -hmm. And my dad's name was George. George Parker. Yeah. And uh, where were we? So you were. So they they were married up there. They were married up there. Yeah. And uh, I, I can envision this. I of course wasn't alive then, so I can't tell you what it was. But they came in. Uh, to, she came in to Burns Lake in the middle of the night and. Uh, they walked around town until the preacher woke up, and uh, he and he they made arrangements to have a, a couple of uh, my dad's uh, friends to be uh, witnesses of the ceremony. But they had a little ceremony there, and, and uh, they went up, went out with the mailman, uh, who was the predecessor to this picture here, and. Uh, Stayed overnight in a log cabin out halfway out there, and then walked walked into his house, which was just a cabin out in the woods. And I can just envision her carrying one of the suitcases, and he had the bigger suitcase, and <laughs> brought her things in. And, and uh, her story is kind of interesting too, because she was born in Kansas to a farm family and went to uh, college in Topeka, Kansas, Washburn University, and uh, started her teaching career. First came to uh, uh, Billings, Montana for about three years, and then uh, got heard about a job in Medford, Oregon, and moved there. And that's how come she came into Southern Oregon. And uh, she taught, uh, she graduated from college in 1907, no, 1921, and went to Montana and then to Portland, or into Medford, and uh, became acquainted with my father's, who of course weren't my father then, but my, the man that became my father, uh, sisters, 
taught school there in Grants Pass in Medford. And she became really close friends with uh, them. And when my dad came down to that wedding anniversary, of course, that's how he come, came to meet her. But uh, mm -hmm. anyway, they, uh, uh, that's where she started. Her, one of her claims to fame that she always talked about was uh, she uh, taught Bill Bowerman, who was a famous uh, track coach at the University of Oregon and one of the founders of Nike along with, uh, uh, can't think of his name now, but the- uh, Bill Knight? Bill Knight, yeah. And, uh, and at the 50th wedding, uh, 50th anniversary of the graduation of Medford High School, that was his 50th year of graduation. He called her out as one of his favorite teachers, and she always oh. thought that was pretty interesting. So, uh, let's see. She was a pretty adventurous young Pardon? woman. She was, and she went to uh, to New York in a. Um, uh, Model A, it must have been. It was too late for Model T, I think. A Model A with a couple of other school teachers, and it was written up in the papers as they'd go through Montana and so forth about this adventurous teachers coming from Oregon to New York. And they stopped at uh, uh, Indianapolis Speedway, and they let them, in those days, they let them run their cars, private cars on the track, you know, so they did that and did various things. Got to New York, and then she came home, and that was a year before she went to Canada. Okay. Huh. So. So anyway, I'm proud of both of them, of course. Oh, yeah. And, and that, um, the cabin where they lived was how far from a settlement, a town? Or a well, about, uh, there was a, a few, most of them were bachelors, a few uh, people that settled in that area about 1910. And uh, it was about 12 miles from where he ended up. So there was, it was about a 12 mile trip. But nobody had a car in those, those days. 12 miles doesn't seem like, like much, but uh, you know, at three miles an hour, which is a fairly fast walk, it would take you four hours to get to the, to the ca uh, and there was a store there. It would take you four hours to get to the store, and four hours of home walking. So it would be, or horseback as far as that, because they don't go too much faster than a person. With a fast walk, you know. So did they have a horse or? Yeah, he had horses, and by then he had, over the years, it slowly built up his farm. Uh, so by the time she went up in 1928, uh, he uh, had four horses, I think, work horses they called them. You know, big percherons and that sort of mm -hmm. large horses for mm -hmm. pulling machinery. Nobody had any motorized vehicles. We never had a telephone. We never had a motorized vehicle. And uh, we, um, well, he, my dad was uh, in his 45, 40s by then, because they married kind of late. My mother was 39, I think, and my dad was 45 when they got married. And he'd had, uh, a little bit of heart trouble and he didn't know about it, but it turned out that he'd apparently been having problems with his heart uh, for quite a while, but nobody went to a doctor up there unless they absolutely had to. Well, mm -hmm. he finally figured it was the first week in January 1944. He had so much pain that he knew he had to do something, so they hauled him into town, which took a day and a half. They had to stop it, uh, where they had their honeymoon night uh, overnight, and then they went on into with the mailman into Burns Lake. And uh, he just got there and fell over and died right there in the waiting room. So, and that was. Uh, huge blow to my mother because here we were the first week in January out there in that little cabin with two kids. They had nice neighbors but they were all two or three miles away and 
no communications between them and other than walking over to see him, you know. So, so that was a, a really blow, and I didn't notice it so much as a 10 year old, I was nine by, by then. But I didn't uh, notice it as much, but I think now what my mother must have gone through up there all alone and uh, no communications. They could telegraph down into the States, but there wasn't any telephone system out there yet. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but she survived, and I didn't know of the pain she had, I'm sure, but mm -hmm. she survived, and uh, she uh, got a hold of uh, her dad's sisters down, back down in Medford that she knew already, and uh, one of them, uh, Gertrude Holmes in Medford said, well, you guys can come down and stay with us for a while until you figure out what to do. So that's what we did. We moved to Medford in uh, June of 1944, towards the end of the Second World War. And uh, so I went to uh, Medford. I was in the fourth grade, one thing my mother was proud about is because she, uh, we had correspondence courses up there and every two weeks uh, from Victoria they would send up lesson plans and we would work through them and grade them or, or we would fill them out and, and they would be sent back to Vancouver by mail. And uh, so my sister went through the eighth grade doing that and I went through the fourth grade. But we came down and apparently was educated enough. We started, I started in the fifth grade, and she started in the ninth grade, and it was no problem. But it was a different way of going to school. And, and she taught the four neighbor kids, too. Uh, neighbors, I say, they were about two or three miles away. So we had the, uh, the school in our little house, and. Uh, the kids, their kids would come over, the Nichols kids would come over and we'd all have, how we all six of us fit in that house with my mother, the teacher, is hard to believe, but uh, it wasn't much bigger than this picture here, oh. so. You know, you, um, just to go back a little bit, I think there was a little interesting story of when you were, when your mother was, I think she was pregnant with you or maybe it was your older sister, and they're they're out there in the Canadian wilderness, and I think did did she go into labor? Um, oh, uh, that story, yeah. When she when I was to be born, mm -hmm. uh, there was a quite a large lake uh, between Burns Lake and Utsa Lake, which is where we were, and uh, they had uh, now they have a ferry system that goes across the lake, but in the winter time. They could go across in a boat in the summer to get to Burns Lake, but in the winter time they you'd just go across on the ice, and it was kind of kind of dangerous, especially in the spring. This was March, so so it was still pretty frozen. But what they did, uh, the mailman that I talked about before had a uh, kind of a, a vehicle that was uh, gas powered and uh, had running boards and. What they'd do is they'd open the doors up and put a rope around the vehicle so if they started going through the ice they could jump out and, and get away and they weren't heavy enough to fall through the ice probably but the truck, they might lose the truck. Well it didn't happen fortunately but my wife particularly enjoys telling that story about this pregnant woman <laughs> having to potentially jump out of the the vehicle as she was going into labor, so. So anyway, that was her story. But she made it to? She made it to Burns oh, Lake, goodness. yeah, that's where I was born. Okay. It was a fairly new hospital then. When my sister was born three and a half years earlier, uh, they just, the doctor just delivered the babies, and there weren't many, of course, in his house. He just had a bedroom that was the hospital. Mm -hmm. And by the time I was born in 1934, uh, I think the hospital was almost brand new then, so. Mm -hmm. So to, to get back to your story, so um, so you and your sister did, uh, 
then go to start school in Medford? We it? went to school in Medford, yes. And my mother became, having lived in Canada, she became a citizen up there. And coming back, she kind of had to start from scratch again. She had to go through naturalization, which always seemed kind of odd to me, but she had to go through the whole process of naturalization, even though she was born, of course, in Kansas and it was an American. But by voting in Canada, you became a, they made it pretty simple, you became a citizen of Canada. Mm -hmm. And so when she came down, technically she was a, a Canadian citizen. So it took her a couple of years and she struggled. She worked for Harry and David packing there in uh, Medford, a big packing house, mm -hmm. and uh, worked in the schools uh, as, a, as a cook in the school system. But then she finally got a job after in naturalization completed. She got a job in uh, out of Grands Pass, in a little town of Kirby for a year. And then through her sister-in-law, who was the principal of a school in Klamath Falls, got her connected with the Klamath school system. So we moved over to Klamath Falls in 1950 and uh, she taught her the rest of her career there in in uh, in Klamath Falls, mm -hmm. and I think she taught till she was about sixty-five or so, which and she was born in eighteen ninety-five. So that was she taught till she was about in the in the sixty nineteen sixties. And then she moved up to uh, to uh, Tualatin here uh, to be near me and my family. So you had, how did you come to Portland or to this area? Well, I, I, after high school in Klamath Falls where she was teaching, I, I went to high school there, I, uh, she insisted I go to Oregon State uh, because she's the only one in her family had ever gone to college and she thought I should be the second one, I guess. So uh, we had a little money left over from some land that had been sold and ta take, actually taken from us in Canada because of some flooding. That's a whole other story we won't get into today. But uh, anyway, she had, uh, I think uh, about three or four thousand uh, dollars from the sale of that land, and she helped me. And I had a couple of jobs when I was in school, but I so I went to Oregon State after uh, after uh, high school for four years, mm -hmm. and went through a ROTC program. In those days. Uh, ROTC was mandatory the first two years in college, but after that it was elective, so you could decide whether you wanted to stay. But if you stayed, then you became an officer and, and you had a two-year commitment. And that was during the Korean War, so everybody was uh, probably, truthfully, some of them were going to college to stay out of the, stay out of the war, you know, that was a real, tough situation over there. But I graduated in college in 1956 and went and became a ROTC officer in the artillery and went to school in Fort Sill, Oklahoma uh, and uh, was stationed in Korea for a couple of years. And the war had ended by then, but things were still very tense, so we didn't see any combat actually, but uh, we were pretty much confined to our units and we were about 20 miles south of the DMZ uh, and north of Seoul, kind of between the two. So I was there for actually 13 months and, uh, mm -hmm. and then had the option of staying in if I wanted to and I didn't want to. They tried to talk me into it, but I decided to get out and, and uh, went to Fort Ord, California for a short time and then got out of the service. Mm -hmm. And then was looking for a job and uh, am I doing okay on time and everything? Okay. 
looking for a job and um, I had taken agriculture in uh, Oregon State thinking that I was ending going back up to Canada because we all love that country and uh, and you still had the, the land up there? We still had, my mother, bless her heart, kept the property and wouldn't, wouldn't sell it. We had opportunities to sell it through the years, but she kept that property. So it's been in the family now 112 years. He, he went up there 112 years ago and homesteaded. In those days, you could get 160 acres and he got two homesteads bought some more so we had about 500 acres all together mm -hmm. and then I mentioned that flooding that took some of it so we have 420 now okay. uh, acres but um, anyway that's what I was thinking of doing when I got out they flooded that area and built a dam and all that in 1950 so that all happened in between these times I'm mentioning um, about when I was over well, in college still then, uh, but... Uh, so you were thinking of becoming a farmer or... A yeah, a rancher or something. or something. Yeah, we had about... Uh, when my dad died, I guess we he developed his herd to the extent of about 50 head of cattle and he had his horses and so forth. So we, we were coming along pretty good for a homesteader that didn't have anything to start with. So so that was my idea to go back to Canada and not realizing how much money it would take to get started really. By then people had tractors and we never had a tractor or anything like that. It was all horse-drawn equipment. But, but he, uh, um, how did he make money with, with the cattle? Did he sell them for? Yeah, in the fall usually they would sell us steers, you know, uh, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, most of, actually, the money he made was on trapping. I didn't mention he had a pretty large trap line that had 11 lakes on them. They're small lakes up there, and uh, there's lots of lakes. They call that the Lake District. And uh, muskrats was in demand for fur. This was in the Second World War. Mm -hmm. And they used muskrat, uh, muskrats for uh, headwear and and moc moccasin type shoes and uh, and uh, and squirrels too. So signs a little cruel at the moment, but uh, he was a trapper and a, and shot squirrels and uh, he had a just it must have been the week he died or before he died. Just before he died, he had a list of his income from the family income for nineteen. Uh, that would have been 1943. And uh, it was $625 or something. I, mm -hmm. I tried to look it up today, but I didn't mm -hmm. find it. But it was over $600. And Which that included $50. The, the, the uh, school system in Victoria would paid my mother $50 a year for teaching, oh. <laughs> which helped a little bit. Yeah. And the neighbor was supposed to help that had the four kids was supposed to help and he did one year and then he quit, but he didn't he quit paying so she didn't insist on it. They couldn't let those kids down. That was their only opportunity for an education, you know, was to come to our house. So, so things were different but happy. We yeah. were a happy family. So back to Oregon, so you finished your, your college education with a degree in agriculture, uh -huh. and, but then what happened to change the course? Well, I went to Korea, of course, for those two years and was in the military for two years. Then with an agricultural background, I found a job in Tule Lake, California, just south of Klamath Falls, for a chemical distributor. You were mentioning earlier, Sandra, about your dad's uh, job, and it was similar to that, for working for a chemical distributor, C except I was on the road uh, selling uh, chemicals, uh, Dow, DuPont-type weed killers and so forth. Mm -hmm. uh, 
mostly in Nevada and Northern California. I had kind of a route down there, but worked out at Tula Lake, California. Okay. So I was there to, for five years and got acquainted with uh, uh, Dell Smith, who was the owner of Evergreen Aviation in McMinnville, Evergreen Helicopters in those days. And uh, he talked me into going to work for him and I really wasn't looking for a job. I was feeling pretty good about where I was working. And, uh, but I was only making $500 a month, I think it was. 550, I guess it was. Anyway, he finally offered me 750. And boy, I thought I was in the Rose's end. So I thought, well, I better, I better quit. Although I wasn't all that anxious to, so. So I left and went to work for him. And then after three years, uh, we, uh, three of us, uh, he, they kind of got out of agricultural spraying and so forth, which was my forte and forestry work and so forth. So they kind of got bigger and got into the airline business and became huge. That was Evergreen Aviation and mm -hmm. out of business now. but. But anyway, I uh, worked for them for three years, and then uh, two, two people I knew, one was a pilot and one was a mechanic, and I started Western Helicopter Services. And that was in November 1966. And we carried on for the next 36 years in, uh, as an aerial applicator, worked all over the western United States, mostly Oregon, Washington, California, but also quite a bit into Idaho and some in Montana and uh, some in Nevada, but mostly Oregon, Washington, and California. Okay. And uh, we started out really on a shoestring. Uh, we had thousand dollars a piece and we incorporated in Portland and uh, my mother who was the retired school teacher loaned us to 11,000 and a friend in Eugene loaned us 3,000 so we started in with that and gradually built it up to when I retired in 19 uh, or 22 20, 2002 we had uh, eight helicopters and 20, 22 employees, I think it was. So we built ourselves up to a fairly small company. We were the largest, though, in aerial application in the Western United States. Uh, we worked for people like Weyerhaeuser and Crown Zellerback and Willamette Industries and Publishers Paper and Menasha and those kind of and large and small family uh, companies too, all over the Northwest. And they were doing aerial application of pesticides uh, for mostly weed control, like 2,4-D, like we use for lawns and so forth. Mm -hmm. and, um, and then in the 1970s, we got into aerial fertilizing where they put on nat nitrogen fertilizer and they discovered that the University of Washington had a bunch of studies on uh, use of fertilizers to get enhance the growth of trees. So that became very popular and still is in the 1970s. Although the price of fertilizer now is about $700 a ton and back then I remember when we started it was $170 a ton. So prices have really gone sky high and at that's diminished the use of fertilizer a little bit, but so we were in those two branches basically. We did some really interesting jobs, though. We did we reseeded Mount St. Helens when it exploded in in uh, June, was it May of nine of uh, nineteen nineteen eighty nineteen eighty. Thank you, mm -hmm. uh, and. Uh, they hired us uh, through a subcontractor to uh, reseed with the helicopters uh, that area below the uh, 
below the explosion on the northeast side or northwest side of the mountain, they were fearful that uh, all that ash, and that ash was where we were working was about 50 foot deep. It was a huge amount of ash, you know, that came out of that explosion. And uh, in order to stabilize that soil so, so it wouldn't all run down into the Columbia eventually, Tootler River first and then into the Columbia, they uh, uh, wanted to put on some grass seed to get, to get the soil stabilized to prevent the erosion. And uh, so that was one of our most interesting jobs and got quite a lot of publicity for whatever that's worth out of that. But uh, we finished that in about a month and, uh, and it worked out really well. It, following year there was a lot of grass grown and there wasn't too much state. Fortunately, the, it wasn't too bad a winter that winter in 1981, uh, so uh, they didn't get too much erosion, but uh, that was, but we did all kinds of large jobs. We worked for the Forest Service and the BLM a lot and State of Oregon and uh, some pretty 30,000 30, acres was a big job for us. We did a lot of thousand acre type jobs. Not much agricultural uh, work for farmers because if you're on flat ground and you have an opportunity to have an airport close, um, it's a lot less expensive to do it by, hel by uh, airplane than by helicopter. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it was hard for us to compete in that branch. Yeah. So were you more involved with the administration of... That's what I did, actually. Did, did you ever fly a helicopter? Well, I, no, not really. I can't say I'm a pilot. I, I you know, would be, we had dual controls in, in a couple of our helicopters, so uh, I could fly a little bit, but nothing, no, I wasn't licensed. In, and my other partner, I had terrific partners, particularly Norm McGrew. We had two Norms out there. Uh, he was uh, one, my, probably my ever best friend, and uh, he passed away a few years back. But uh, he was an outstanding mechanic, and helicopters take a lot of maintenance, and uh, so he handled that end of it. And Al Cole, the other partner, was a excellent instructor and a good pilot in his own right and he uh, supervised uh, well I did all the scheduling and all that so he did he wasn't once he had him trained he wasn't too involved in it in anything directly but uh, so he was just working mostly as a, one of the pilots but uh, we I was fortunate to have those two Norma Group particularly probably had as much to do with uh, the success of the company as I did. So mm -hmm. Al retired a little earlier, about 15 years before we did. So, mm -hmm. so we're really proud of the company. It's still in existence. It changed hands a couple of times. It, we were at the, we're at the Newburgh Airport and uh, still traveling all over the country with mm -hmm. on jobs. And you and did you settle in Tualatin because your mother Marguerite was here already? Well, we came here first, actually. In 1970, we moved in a Apache Bluff area over here by past the cemetery, mm -hmm. and uh, it was just getting developed. In fact, we bought one of the. Uh, well, I got married. I should mention my family. I guess <laughs> I got I got married in 19. 65 when I was uh, working for Evergreen and uh, had two children. David was born in 71 and Sarah in 77. And uh, I'm very proud of them. Sarah's a school teacher and David's a property manager and both doing very well, have families, well, I only have one grandchild, unfortunately, and she's a 
She's a, a doll. I love her dearly, and uh, she's graduating from college next year and wants to be a teacher, too, so oh, she's okay. kind of following in my mother's footsteps. So. What's her name, your granddaughter's name? My granddaughter, uh, Corona. She goes by Cora, but C-O-R-O-N-A, Corona. Oh, oh, and they live, uh, she lives with her dad over here in Apache Bluff. He, he lives in, not the house I used to live in, in the same general area in Tualatin, so I see him all the time, so we're real close. Well, I am with both of them. Oh, good. And, and I married the second time, first time I got divorced mm -hmm. in 1960, can't remember now, 65, no. Anyway, uh, that's beside the point, I guess. I, 1990, yeah. I got divorced in 1990. And uh, was around Tualatin and working all the time and, uh, and uh, connected. I didn't have too much connection with Tualatin other than living here. Uh, I'm not a, a Tualatin historian by any means, but I married one, and that, I'll talk about that in a minute, but um, I uh, was a member, actually my mother started first, she, when she came up here in 1970, I think it was, she started going to the uh, Methodist Church, and then David was born, my son and uh, we decided we better start going to church and we went to the Presbyterian Church over in Lake Grove. They didn't have a Presbyterian Church here in Tualatin and I had been a Presbyterian as high school and so forth. So uh, we, we started going over to Lake Oswego at first and then we, my mother, through my mother who started with the Methodist, uh, I start going there, we, we, I should say, and been there ever since. I've been there 50 years now, I guess it has oh, been. Oh. A member there, a great, great little church, and it's still there, first church in Tualatin. This building we're in today was actually the first church, uh, full-time church in Tualatin. This was a Methodist church before they rebuilt up on the hill, so. Mm -hmm. Now this is the Heritage Center, and we're real proud of that. But I got involved in uh, getting back to my history in Tualatin. It really wasn't much uh, until I, through church, I started going to church, and I was involved uh, uh, with my, uh, well, this was a little later, we moved to, well, I better get my story corrected on time frame, um, Lois Martinazzi, my wife, uh, and happens to be a, a great friend of Sandra Carlson is interviewing me here. And, but uh, Lois and Sandra's aunt uh, started the Historical Society. So when I, uh, after I got divorced and was single there for about five years, I had known Lois for quite a number of years because she was a longtime Methodist uh, a member too. So she had been married uh, to Larry Lee at that time and, and uh, so I knew her socially and we were good friends and after we were both been divorced for five years, some way or other we decided maybe we'd like to get better acquainted and we ended up getting married in 1997, in 1997, I yeah. Thought it, I thought it was 2000. <laughs> 2000? That, I remember coming to your wedding, it was... Oh, uh, let me think now. I... Boy. It, yeah, check with Lois, I've got Lois. Lois here says she won't. <laughs> This won't be a happy day for me. Uh, but you had been dating. We were married in 1997, yeah. 
I think so. Um, is that 25 years ago? I think it is. Um, some, some, yeah, something like that. Yeah, it was 97. Yeah, Sam. oh it was, okay, okay. <laughs> yeah. But it and was, it was a lovely wedding, lots of people there. And yeah, we had 300 people there. A lot of that due to yeah. Lois's long-term connection. She was a uh, daughter of pioneer family on both sides, the Martin Azzi side and the Jurgen side. And uh, so she knew more people than I did, but between us we had 300 friends that were at our wedding. and. Uh, and had the reception out at one of her sister's Rochelle's. So um, we have a big connection with Tualatin now. Although we, I have to be honest, we live in the Lake Grove area, Lake Oswego. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, we just were looking at for houses and couldn't find anything in Tualatin in 1997. So we've been, uh, over there, the same house for 25 years. Mm -hmm. so. But you still you come to Tualatin a lot because yeah, Lois says she Lois says she she uh, works lives in Tualatin but sleeps in Lake Oswego, <laughs> so that's kind of where I am too. <laughs> yeah, because you're involved with the men's group at the church. Yeah, and, we have a men's group at the Tualatin Church, and we. Both members of the Grange, which is the mm -hmm. farm organization, which fits into some of my interests and hers. Uh, and uh, I did a lot of work with the Homeowners Association over there. After I retired, I kind of went into community service or whatever you want to call it and worked uh, for a lot, worked with a lot of organizations. Mm -hmm but mostly the historical society and the church and the Grange mm -hmm. and the homeowners association. So yeah. I've been fairly busy and yeah. trying to slow down a little bit. Yeah. So uh, well, that's well, kind of my story. Well, that's a great I, story. I probably skipped a few things, but I didn't want it to go too long. <laughs> so you're enjoying retirement now. I am, I am. We travel quite a bit. We've been to uh, to uh, Italy, where Lois's family originated. Met some of the uh, cousins. I guess you would it'd be cousins. And been to England and been to Russia. We had a great trip to Russia. Went down the river between Moscow and Saint Petersburg, and uh, of course go to Canada. I try to go back to Canada every year. Other than the COVID year, I uh, went. To, I've been going up there since 1970, so I guess that would be 50 years straight, except for that one year, COVID year. So you go back to that property and yeah, you and I built a house up there in 19. Well, about the time Lois and I were married, 1997, built a nice little house right next to the old cabin. It's still partially standing. Is it? And uh, we had a post office down the road. This is what this picture I was going to show. I don't know, should I? You want to take the picture, take a photo of the picture now, or? Okay, I'll show this. It's, this is the Marilla post office that my mother named. It was the only post office in that area of Utsa Lake, O O T S A Lake. And uh, that shows me, first trip we went back, I'm standing over here, the first trip we went back in uh, 19, uh, let me get this straight. Uh, 19.52. Nineteen, yeah, 1952, I guess. Anyway, I was 18 years old, and, and I was standing by the post office, and that that would show you, give you an idea of the type of life we had. That was just somebody's house, and he was 
some way got the job of postmaster, and uh, twice a week he'd go up to Utsa Lake, which is a settlement up the road about uh, 12 miles, and uh, pick up the mail and bring it back, and then we'd go over to his house and pick it up. I remember riding over there and our horses, my sister and I both had little Indian horses, we called them, because we bought them from the Indians, and uh, would ride over to the post office to pick up the mail. And the, the interesting thing about the Roswell was the name of the owner of the building and the postmaster, and he was really strict about his job and the uh, thing that always uh, put a smile on my face with my dad's, one of my dad's stories was in the early days he went over to get his mail and um, I, post office hours I guess from nine to five or so, nine to four and he was strict about that so my dad went over there thinking he, he was a bit hurrying going trapping or something, and he wanted to get his mail a little early, and he got over there at 7.30, and Roswell wouldn't give it to him. He said, well, you wait here till we open. And, and uh, he said, somebody might hear about this. And he said, who's, my dad said, who's gonna hear about it? We're out here. <laughs> There's nobody within five miles of us. Oh, he said, I can't, can't. So he sat there for, a half hour before they'd give him his mail. <laughs> Here's the guy that he'd known since high school. <laughs> That's pretty strict. <laughs> but he was straight. Oh, Roswell didn't want to make a mistake. Well, so he, that was his house in the post office. Yeah, that's a great picture. Yeah. And, uh, and, and you've had a very interesting life. And thank you. No well, thank you. I uh, don't know how long we've gone on, but I enjoy talking about Canada particularly, and hope it's hope uh, you're doing a great job, if I may say so, Sandra, of doing all these uh, interviews of the people around Tualatin, and most of them talk about the history, and I haven't much because I don't have that much history, but I. Hopefully I had an interesting story for you. You did, you did. Thank you very much. So.